Vincent Brown is already bringing his expertise to North Carolina A&T, and Norfolk State sweeps Maryland Eastern Shore in a pivotal MEAC matchup. Oh yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, of course, Sam Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off, does not mean that the journey is over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives, which you can see right here at the bottom of the screen. But then also, if you're on the audio side of things, don't forget the S on the end. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. They want to help you find qualified candidates that you need to move the most efficiently that you can in 2023. All you have to do is post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions do apply. In Vincent Brown, has already brought his expertise to North Carolina a and And I don't just mean like, okay, he's literally here. His mind is here. I'm referencing his first recruiting class. And I think this is an interesting one. I always like to look at a coach's first recruiting class. The reason isn't because of the success that a team feels like they should have or a program wants to have in the first year of a new program, especially not with North Carolina a and I know that they have high aspirations. They likely want their first year. Of course, everybody does. But I think they expect their first year in the CAA to be kind of similar to their own women's basketball team first year in the CAA, where they are com uh, competitive, where they are near the top. The Lady Aggies have been doing a thing. They've been one of the best teams in women's basketball in the conference all year long. I think that the football team expects to be one of those teams as well in the first year. But the reason I'm paying attention to this recruiting class doesn't have anything to really do with expectations. It's way more generic than that. It has to do with the fact that I want to see what the vision of the coach is. I know that Coach Brown came. He said, listen, we don't we don't mold talent to the scheme. We mold scheme to the talent. That sounds good in theory, and I do believe that that's the actual way you should do it. You need to have some sort of versatility with your higher ups, with your leadership positions that you can be like, okay, well, we want to be a run first team, but we have a dynamic quarterback. We need to open it up. You have to have that ability to diversify. But at the same time, if we're looking at someone's first recruiting class, really any recruiting class, you have a vision for these players. You know where you would like these players to fit. And we'll talk about how these some of these players have multiple fits, but that's important. You are kind of pulling in talent to fit to your scheme because you know what you want to do. Now, maybe when they get there, you realize you do something better, but when you bring in talent, it's with a vision. That's a scheme. You bring in talent for the scheme, right? So I think it's a little bit more of both than just one or the other, if you're going to be a good coach. And I think that Brown is going to be a good coach. And when I say his, his expertise, I mean the fact that they recruited a bunch of linebackers. And what does he do? He's a former linebacker at Mississippi Valley State with the New England Patriots. This is his expertise. And he brings in four new linebackers. Four new linebackers, some with a little bit of versatility. This is a six-person recruiting class in February. We're only talking about the February class right now. We'll reference the early signing day at the beginning or at the end of this segment, excuse me. So that's four new linebackers, two of which have a little bit of versatility. You have a player who is a linebacker slash safety. You have a player who is a linebacker slash defensive end. I love the versatility, but then you also have to look. This is linebackers, and he is a linebacker. You have to think that when he went in recruiting, he got some versatile players because you don't want to just get linebackers, right? You don't want just four linebackers out of six players and just like, that's it. That's a little bit. I think that that's a little too much of a concentration on one position. So you got a little bit of two true linebackers, one linebacker safety, one linebacker defensive end. So now you have a heavy front seven recruiting class because at the worst, five or, or four of the six players will be front seven players, whether that's defensive linemen or linebackers. And we're hammering home the, the, the expertise fashion because 
This is looking at the mind of what he's trying to craft. This is clearly a position that he feels like he needs to make sure he has greatness at. Now you look at the linebacker slash safety, George. You're looking at a player who, if you have a lot of great linebackers, cool, we can push him back to safety. Maybe he is one of the best linebackers. So you put him at the linebacker position and that probably boosts your range, your ability to coverage, cover at the position. Or maybe you want to have kind of the best of both worlds. And I see this a lot with my Saints. I like to reference these things because that's who I get to see the most often, the most consistently is the New Orleans Saints. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson for when he was here, he was a slot guy, but he was heavy in the box. Well, with a safety linebacker hybrid player, you can do that. If he's really good at coverage, you can put him in a slot. You can have him as a strong safety who is often in the box. You have that ability to diversify his role. You can mold the scheme to him. Same with the defensive end, right? That's Josh Isaiah. I hope I said that right. It's I-S-E-A-H. That's the linebacker slash defensive end. He had three and a half sacks. He had two interceptions, seven pass breakups. So now this gives you either if you want him to be a linebacker, it allows you to give somebody who can on maybe rush downs, depending on how, how your pass rush is that season, he can be one of the players that rush on third down. Maybe it's third and 11. All right, we're going to let Josh run a rush. Maybe you want to have somebody who's just a blitzer, and he comes from his linebacker position. He doesn't have to put his hand in the dirt. He doesn't have to in order to rush the passer. He can easily blitz from the second level. Or maybe he's just a better defensive end. Now he's a better defensive end. It allows you to drop that defensive end. We see that a lot in football where you just drop the defensive end. And he just kind of covers some space. Well, as a hybrid player, he has that experience. He has the ability to do that. So I love how he, talking about, excuse me, so many guys I'm talking about. I love how Brown has hammered in on the position that he knows, the position that I feel like we would trust him to scout the best, but then also given versatility and, and it allowed his philosophy to still stay the same so while vincent brown got a lot of linebackers he also got a safety possibly he also got another defensive end possibly and then he also got one wide receiver that's the one non-defensive player on here so you look at that first recruiting class all offense look at the second recruiting class outside of a wide receiver who really seemed like he belonged in the december class it's full of defense so you have pretty much half and half a well-balanced Recruiting class, when you look at it as a total package, it is a total package. Seeing that it's fully offense, fully defense, no stone really unturned. Got pretty much everything except for a defensive tackle and a cornerback when you're looking at it. So pretty much every, but every positional group is covered. Offensive line, running back, wide receiver, quarterback, defensive line, linebacker, secondary. You have at least one player in all of those areas. And then also in the second recruiting class, you allowed Vincent Brown to kind of hint a little bit at his philosophy that, you know what, we got to make sure that we have good linebacker play. Tyquan King, Jacob Roberts, they're gone. We have to make sure we have good linebacker play, and it makes sense because you have a former linebacker as your head coach. And going forward, we're going to be talking about some MEAC basketball because Norfolk State just swept Maryland Eastern Shore in a pivotal matchup and one that will have ramifications and ramifications is actually going to be the word of the week because it feels like that's what we're going to be talking about really often as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before I get into that, today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. There we go. We ain't seen LinkedIn in a minute, but we're here sponsored by them today. And this is for all of my small business owners. If you are a small business owner, I don't think there's any excuse to not be on LinkedIn and consistently looking for somebody who fits your philosophy. We talked about molding scheme to the talent. Well, we also have to mold some of the talent to the scheme and you have to bring in people who you know fit. We're talking about recruiting and that's all this is in the business world. We talk about North Carolina a ts recruiting class. Well, let's look at your recruiting class. If you're a carpenter, go get somebody who is skilled in building, has their, their work on their LinkedIn profile. And if you're somebody who's skilled in building, make sure your work is on your LinkedIn profile. It's pretty simple. So go ahead and go to linkedin.com slash locked on college to get people who fit your mold today. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free and terms and conditions do apply. As we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. Make sure you're checking out Locked on College. Basketball is everything that you need around the sport, all conferences, all levels, in one place, wherever you listen or watch your podcast. So basically wherever you're watching or listening to me right now, just go ahead and go to Locked on College right afterwards. And I want to talk about North Norfolk State because Norfolk State just swept Maryland Eastern Shore in a pivotal matchup. And the fact that it was a sweep was arguably the most pivotal moment of it. See, the second time the two teams face each other is always interesting because you have a little bit more experience. You have more hands-on film. 
you can sit there and say, well, I felt like my shooting guard didn't do this well. I felt like they attacked us at this area of the court. We have to make sure we protect. There's so many different ways that you can plan for a game once you played somebody as opposed to just looking at film for others because you know how they're going to attack you or you think so. So you can either, sometimes it's like a lopsided affair that gets closer. Sometimes it's the same result. Sometimes it's, you know, it's it's completely different. When you see one team just figured it all the way out. I would say that both teams figured out the other team's defense in this matchup as compared to the first. We're going to be doing a lot of comparison between the first time that the, the uh, that Norfolk State and Maryland Eastern Shore fared and then the second time that they faced off. Because the first time they played a very defensive, low-scoring affair. You're looking at 57-46 for Norfolk State. This time it's a very offensive game. You're looking at 76-73, uh, so it's a closer matchup, but it still went the way of Norfolk State. And you're looking at, honestly to me, I was just watching uh, the Islam fight versus Islam versus Volkanovski. Excuse me. I was too busy worried about not messing up how to say Islam's last name. That I had a brain fart on who he was fighting. But I kind of I kind of relate these matchups to an MMA fight where you enter your opponent's domain, stylistically I'm speaking. And you go in and you win playing their game. That's what Norfolk State did the first time. They went and they had a very defensive matchup against a very good defensive team, but they had just enough offense to squeak by. Now, the second time you play, you are bringing them into your domain. You say, you know what? We're going to have an offensive game now. Yeah, we did the defensive thing when we faced off last time. Now y'all going to come do what we do. Let's see if you can score with us. And they, they were able to score with them, but not enough. See, it was just enough offense to squeak by a defensive game. And it was just too little offense to keep up for Maryland Eastern Shore in an offensive game. So both of these, honestly, ironically, I guess the uh, my analogy with the whole domain, it fits where these are my home in a way. But I mean, stylistically, you got two different stylistic fights and Norfolk State was able to come up victorious in both of them. To me, that's impressive to me that I, I, I personally, maybe it's just because I'm an MMA guy, but I think that that's impressive. So you look at Joe Bryant in the Norfolk State offense. In that first game, they didn't shoot the ball too well. In this game, they shot it better. Number-wise, you wouldn't see it. That's because they started putting it together in the second half of game one, and they just kind of carried it over, right? Because in the second half, they shot 60%, 63% to be exact, actually. You shot 63% from the field. Great. You roll over in this game, you shoot 50% in the first half. You know, it ends up being a total of 47%, which is technically lower than your total average against or your total com, uh, shooting percentage, basically, against them the first time. But you also didn't have a 60% half that carried everything way up. You were way more balanced. You were way more efficient over the total of 40 minutes. So number wise, you're right in the middle of the pack. You're right in average range for what you typically shoot over the season. Right. I think it's like the 15th out of. 20 something so you're kind of below average but you're facing a really good defense so having below average numbers against a really good defense is kind of expected it's kind of expected you would like to not do it but it doesn't shock anybody and you're still able to score you're able to get to the free throw line more you're able to get more points from more players you look at the first game you had joe bryan score 15 points he was the only player in double digits and the leading scorer for norfolk state now in this game you got two players who hit 15 points. You got one player, or excuse me, three players in total who hit double digits. So it's just, it's a different game. I don't want to focus too much on the shooting percentage because the overall scoring was significantly greater. And part of that had to do with the fact that you were also still able to get to the free throw line in addition. But you look at Joe Bryant. Joe Bryant, the man. 15 points the first time. Yeah, but this time he had 25. And he showed why he's one of the best players in the conference. Going against one of the best defenses there. They were the better two-way team. Norfolk State was the better two-way team. Joe Bryant was able to make down or, or knock down some key shots. He had the, the layup on a fast break that actually put Norfolk State up for good about five minutes less, left in the game. He followed that up with a three-pointer that gave him a five-point lead. And from there, it was just kind of cruise control. You just kind of had to keep them at bay, and they did. Never got it tied up, never lost their lead. And that was off of those cu couple of buckets that Joe Bryant was able to make. Now, what does this mean? I feel like Norfolk State is kind of overshadowed in this in this conference over the last couple of weeks because when they lost to Howard, it gave them two losses. And that put them at third place. 
Well, now you're at third place, and it's like, okay, well, we got two teams. We're going to be talking about MEAC basketball. There's two teams that we have to talk about ahead of you because they have better records. But now you're at second place. And the thing about that is you're right behind Howard, and if it wasn't for a controversial ending, right, because they lost to Howard, not because of a last-second bucket. They lost to Howard because of the enforcing of a rule. And you may or may not, it really just depends on how you feel about if that rule should have been enforced in that moment. I wouldn't, if you say they shouldn't enforce that rule, okay, I'll let you have it. Me, I can't tell them not to do it. That was my side on it, but that's not the point today. It's the fact that it was something so small, something r relatively controversial, to be honest. I'll use that word again. And that's what separates Norfolk State from being first place. And honestly, if that loss didn't happen, I don't think we're sitting around here having them be overshadowed because they're second place. Actually, they'd be first place because they'd already beat Maryland Eastern Shore. And now they'd be at first place all alone. But that's not what happened. We're not going to sit over here and cry over smil spilled milk or whatever. They have beat Maryland Eastern Shore two times. The Hawks have been swept by Norfolk State. So what happens now? You got to hope that Norfolk State loses. It sucks because can't nobody else beat the Hawks but Norfolk State. It is what it is. But you got two losses to a team that's one of the best in the conference. That's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt you. But that's going to help Norfolk State. I can't wait until they play Howard at the end of the year. I'm not going to put tunnel vision on and just look at Howard versus Norfolk State in the last game the way we did with Virginia State and Virginia Union. But I do see how it could end up being the game that means just the same amount. But I won't put those blinders on because I think that Maryland Eastern Shore has shown themselves to be a really good team, a really competitive team, and we'll have to see what they look like as the season goes on. But speaking of Virginia Union, Virginia State, and the CIA number one seed, well, Winston-Salem State ain't got no chance at that anymore because I believe that they just cost themselves a shot at the number one seed by losing back-to-back -back games to Claflin and then also Fayetteville State. We'll talk about that as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before we get into that, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Built Bar is the number one protein bar on the market, bar none. I'm talking about the Swiss Army knife of protein bars. I'm talking about the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. You can taste it if you just want a snack. You can eat it if you want something healthy. You can eat it if you're about to go to the gym. There's so many uses. So many uses for Built Bar. Built Bar is absolutely delicious. I love them, right? Back when I was working out, I need to do a little better. But when I was, I eat me a blueberry uh, Built Bar on my way into the gym. And then sometimes if I just catch one laying around, you know what? I am kind of hungry. Or maybe I just want a snack. How many protein bars are you eating just for a snack? Built Bar is the short is on that short list. You got to go ahead and get your Built Bar. But if you want to go ahead and get it right now, stat, 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 you can continue listening to this third segment. Pop me in your earphones, go into the car, and go to Walmart. Go to Sam's Club. They have variety packs there. Or maybe you just want to open up your laptop. You can wait a little bit, have a little bit of patience, and use the promo code LOCKED15 on the website built.com to get 15% off your offer. That's what I do, but I understand. These things are so delicious, you might not want to wait. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate y'all for making us your first listen of the day, having all the way to segment three. So thank you two times for that. We're going to be placing a heavy emphasis on CIAA basketball over the next two weeks because their storylines leading up into the tournament. For, for example, what we're going to talk about today, Winston-Salem State just lost back-to-back -back games to Claflin and then also Fayetteville State. And I think that's going to cost them a chance at the number one seat. That's one of the storylines we're going to talk about leading up to the tournament and the tournament's next week. So over the next 10 episodes, probably going to be talking about them eight to 10 times. I could see that, you know, like this is going to be a heavy emphasis. Next week is going to be a lot of CIAA tournament. And if I get credentials to get to New Orleans and go to the Legacy Bowl, go to the HBCU Combine, it'll be heavy emphasis on both of those things. So fingers crossed that I am able to get on location and be in New Orleans. Not up to me. It's up, it's up in the air now. But here's the thing. We're going to talk about Winston-Salem State because to me, Virginia Union, Virginia State, Fayetteville State, Claflin. Those are four teams that are warring for those top two spots. Winston-Salem State is out of that conversation to me now. Like, I just don't, I don't see that in the cards because you just lost two games in a row to the two teams that are ahead of you. And there's only two games left. It just continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Because let's just be honest about it. There's only two games left, so every game is going to mean more at this point. So you lose two games, and luckily for you, Claflin lost a game after they beat you. Fayetteville State lost a game before they beat you. So luckily, the two teams that you're facing off and trying to get number one in the, in the South for, 
they lost the game too. So it's not out of reach. But I think the best thing that you can really reach for, the best thing that you can really hope for is being the number one seed in the South. But being the number one seed in the in the in the whole division or in the whole conference, sorry, I just I don't I don't think that's gonna be the case. So being able to still get the number one seed in the South or win the South Division, I don't even want to say number one seed. Still being able to win the South Division, yeah, it allows you to put a positive spin on it. It's a silver lining and things of that nature. But at the same time, you lying to yourself if you say it doesn't sting a little bit knowing that you can't be the number one seed. Of course, that's not the only thing that matters. Because when we talk about the number one seed, that's the top goal, but it's not like you just disappear afterwards. Oh, well, Winston-Salem can't get the number one seed. Snap them away like Thanos. No, they can still be three. I think that's the hype for them. I don't think they get one or two. I don't think they're going to have a better record than Union or Virginia State. Um, but you can still win the South, like I said, and winning the South would likely put you at number three. Um, that's not bad, but I think there's a good chance they're five, maybe even six. See, here's the thing. By losing two games in a row to Claflin and Fayetteville State, you're no longer in that four-team mix that I talked about. You're actually in a very similar situation as those four teams, but you're in a situation with the teams who are under them. Instead of being one of the teams that's competing for the top two seeds in the tournament, you're one of the teams that's trying not to lose another game so you don't drop to eight. Completely different. That's where Winston-Salem is now. That's the ramifications of this win. I mean, of this loss. Both of these losses. And remember I told you, ramifications is going to be kind of the word of the week because when talking about the CIAA, it's going to be a heavy emphasis on what are the ramifications of the games that we're previewing? What are the ramifications of the outcome of the game that we're reviewing? That's what we're going to be talking about going into the tournament. It'll be a little bit less X's and O's, a little bit less breakdown of how each team won or how each team lost and more so of what do these games mean because there's only two games left. Every game has a ginormous amount of meaning now, unless you're like at the bottom and it's like whatever. But we're mostly focusing on the teams that are going to be the top eight seeds. We're focusing on those top four. We're focusing on a, a Winston-Salem, a Shaw, right? We're focusing on a Lincoln. These are the type of games that we're looking at as we continue talking about this team or about this conference in this tournament going forward. Like I said, I think a high, just to sum it up, a high for Winston-Salem is three. And that means that Claflin or Fayetteville State, there's one that you have the tiebreaker on is really kind of confusing. Some tiebreakers are simple. Some tiebreakers aren't. Um, I think Fayetteville State swept them. So you lose to, you're hoping that you tie with Claflin. And then you have to wonder what the tiebreaker looks like from there. And hopefully you can get the number three seed. But more likely than not, you're going to be looking at four to six. I think that's the likely range for Winston-Salem. Just sucks because you lost two games in a row. You could have been fighting for that number two or maybe even that number one spot. But most likely number two. But you could have been fighting for that. But unfortunately, you're fighting for five through eight. We'll see where they end up because, like I said, we will be talking about this tournament and the ramifications of many games as we continue with Locked on HBC and you continue to make us your first listen of the day every day because I really do appreciate it. For your second listen of the day, make sure you're checking out Locked on College Basketball. It's everything you need around the sport in one place wherever you get your podcast. Very easy. Just go ahead and type it up where you're listening or watching me right now. It's that simple. On tomorrow's episode, we're going to be breaking down some of the best action from SWAC basketball, which is going to be coming up tonight. So be on the lookout for that. But in the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. Stay blessed. Peace. I finally did it. I finally had the lights out. I've been hoping that I would hit right where the lights clicked out and I said, peace. Hope this isn't weird. Y'all hear me talk. Peace.